The first thing we should do to solve this question is label our charges. We can call the one nanocoulomb charge Q1, the charge at the lower right corner of the triangle Q2, and the remaining charge Q3. Next, we want to draw the electrostatic forces that are acting on the charge labeled Q1 because the question asks us for the net force on the one nanocoulomb charge, which we have labeled Q1. Let's begin by examining the force that Q2 would be exerting on Q1. Notice that both Q2 and Q1 are positive, and we know that like charges repel. So that means that Q2 is going to exert a repulsive force on Q1, and to draw it, you simply want to follow this dashed line that connects the charges, and then extend an arrow or a vector in the same direction as that dashed line, and we can label that F21. This simply means the force that charge 2 is exerting on charge 1. Similarly, we're going to draw the electrostatic force that Q3 is exerting on Q1. Both of those charges are also positive, so we have another repulsive force. Follow the dashed line between the charges, and then when you land on Q1, just extend that line in the same direction, and we can label that F31 for the force that charge 3 is exerting on charge 1. Next, it's going to be helpful to get some angles straightened out. We can see that this is a 60 degree angle right here, and from high school geometry, we would probably recognize that this angle also will have to be 60 degrees. Basically, those two angles are what are called corresponding angles. You have two parallel lines here that are cut by a third line, and the corresponding angles are congruent. And in a similar way, we can conclude that because this is a 60 degree angle, this corresponding angle up here is also 60 degrees. And then because it's a bit cluttered over here, we're going to come over on a separate x, y axis and we're going to label those two forces acting on the one nanocoulomb charge along with the angles. Our next step is going to be to calculate the magnitude of each of those two forces. And to calculate the magnitude of each of those forces, we're going to use Coulomb's law. Now in this chapter, we're learning that the force between two charged particles is equal to a constant multiplied by the charge, the magnitude of charge, I should say, on the first charge, multiplied by the magnitude of charge on the second charge, and then divided by the distance between those charges squared. So, for example, if we were to calculate the force that charge 2 is exerting on charge 1, we would fill in the constant, the Coulomb's constant, followed by the magnitude of charge 2, or actually we can do charge one. Now charge one is one nanocoulomb. So be careful here, you're going to want to do one, and because it's nanocoulomb, you will multiply that by 10 to the minus nine. So that would get that charge in terms of coulombs. And then the magnitude of charge two happens to be two nanocoulombs. So here we'll fill in two times 10 to the minus nine. And then we're going to divide that by the distance between charges two and one squared. That distance is one centimeter. Make sure you divide that by 100 to get it into meters. So you'll have 0 0.01 meters. And then also don't forget to square it. So let's pick up our calculator and compute that value. And when you do that, you will get a magnitude of force between charges two and one equal to 1.8 times 10 to the minus four. And then dimensionally, this is going to be in newtons. So that's great, we've got that magnitude. We have to set up a similar calculation for the force that charge three is exerting on charge one. Again, we're gonna be plugging into Coulomb's law here. Let's go ahead and fill in the data. We'll notice that the data are actually identical because Q3 also has a charge of two nanocoulombs and the distance between Q3 and Q1 was also one centimeter. So we can compute this force and we'll get the exact same magnitude that we got earlier. 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. So far so good, but now after computing these magnitudes, we need to figure out their components. And one of the best ways to do that is to fill in what I like to call a force table. So let's take a look at that force table. So in a force table, you're going to have three columns. You're going to have one column for your force a second column for the x component of that force, and a third column for the y component of that force. We'll notice that to find the x component of force, we simply take the magnitude of the force and multiply it by the cosine of a particular angle, which we will talk about in just a moment. 
and for the y component you take the magnitude of the force and multiply it by the sine of that same angle. Now, the angle is what often trips students up, so let's be very careful about that angle. Let's start out with F21. We know the magnitude. Let's take a look at how we drew F21 in our diagram. Now, a lot of students would just automatically plug 60 degrees in for that angle. But in fact, when you're measuring your angle, make sure that you're measuring it relative to the positive x axis. So in other words, when measuring your angle, you actually want to come up with the angle from the positive x axis all the way over to your force of interest. So that angle right there is not 60 degrees, the one in green. In fact, that would be 120 degrees because we would subtract 60 from the 180 degrees that makes up that straight line right there. So the angle we're going to use for F21 is going to be 120 degrees. So when you plug that into your force table, you would take your magnitude, which was the 1.8 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons, and then multiply that by the cosine of 120 degrees. Now for the y component, you simply take the magnitude and multiply it by the sine of that same angle. So again, 120 degrees. Let's take a look next at F31. This one's a little easier, perhaps, because that force is labeled with a 60 degree angle, and that 60 degrees happens to be already measured relative to the positive x-axis. So, in other words, from the x-axis to F31, that angle is 60 degrees. So we'll do the magnitude times the cosine and sine of 60 degrees. So we've plugged in those values. Let's make a little bit of room by erasing this picture. And then what you're going to do, very simply, to get the net force, so we're going to just do F net here, is you're going to pick up a calculator. You're going to add the two X components together. Make sure your calculator is set to degree mode. And then you're also going to add the two Y components together. Now, interestingly, when you add the two X components together, the sum will simply be zero newtons. Confirm that on your calculator when you add those two X components together. When you add the two Y components, the sum is going to be approximately positive 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4. And of course, this turns out to be in Newtons. So one way of writing the final answer to the question, if we were to use unit vector notation, is we could say that the net force is 0 Newtons, and then we would label that with I hat, because that represents the X direction plus, and then 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons, labeled with j hat, because that represents the y direction. Zero newtons is kind of negligible, so you could also simply express your final answer with just the y component. So we'll just write that down. So that's a second way of expressing the answer. And then a third way of expressing the answer would be to simply say that the net force on the one nanocoulomb charge is the 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4 newtons. And then you can simply say directed upward. Notice it's upward because the net force was acting in the y direction, as labeled by J hat, and it was positive. It was positive 3.1 times 10 to the minus 4. So that's why we're saying it's directed upward.